We're talking with uh, associate head coach uh, Matt Brown from Denver University and the men's lacrosse program. And we always start out the, the interviews, Matt, with a, with a simple question. There's been, over the last year, a lot of discussion about sort of not removing the alley dodge, but maybe make, not making it quite as significant in, in the offensive process is in that. And your background in box is legendary. So my question is, are those tied together and are we losing the alley dodge as a component for offense and lacrosse? Yeah, well, first off, Greg, thanks for having me on and uh, excited to spend some time with you. Um, I don't think so. You know, when it comes to the alley dodge, I, I think everything we do in, in sports is, is cyclical. You know, uh, what's old is new, what's new is old. And I think um, even with, with my heavy box background where things are a little bit more you know, coming from the wing a little bit more inside out, east, west, there's still a ton of value with guys being able to put their foot in the ground and turn the corner going downhill in the alley. Um, at the end of the day, you know, I, I think when you look, when you talk to offensive coordinators, it's what has defenses not covered lately? You know, what have they not mastered? And where do you need to figure out to go with that? And if, you, if you're able to produce great scoring opportunities and the ball goes back in the net, I think that's one of the beautiful things of our sport is there's so many different ways to play this game. And, uh, you know, that's why uh, that's why I love being a part of it. As an offensive mind, you would you be a good defensive coach? You know, I, I, I always I always tell uh, Coach T that that I think I would. Uh, we, we've kid around. Uh, I because I think on the flip side he he'd be a great offensive coach as well and we've kind of kidded around a few times of you know maybe for a fall we should switch roles and uh, you know but at, at the end of the day I think you know it, it's in sports you know I think uh, you're stealing from everybody you know you take a little bit of pieces from what you see this guy does and you take a little bit of pieces from what that guy does and you know I, I think over the years you know fortunately we we've seen everything thrown at us from zones to single shot offs to double shot shut offs to you name it and uh you know it's it's a jigsaw puzzle and you're trying to solve the equation and um, it makes it a lot of fun does then that become my my athletes just have to be better than yours there's a piece of that you know and i think that's where you're seeing uh recruiting is uh is so vital and, and so important you know i think there's there's obviously a lot of things that you can teach i think skill set and iq is something that we stress a ton upon. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's, there's just th some things that God gave you that others don't have. And, uh, you know, if, if you, if you lack them, uh, you're, you're kind of swimming upstream a little bit. Right. And so, um, you know, I think recruiting is a big peak component of it. And at the end of the day, you need to have some horses. I always have conversations with defensive coaches and the, the one caveat you can't change is, and, and it doesn't matter the sport in offense, I know where I'm going defensively you don't correct that's always an advantage for me and it'll never change based on the facts of everything being equal and I think that kind of gives you the the step up over over your defensive partner and conversely I think it also takes longer to understand where everybody's going than early in the season than what defense might is that is that a fair assumption no no doubt yeah no, no doubt and, and I think you have multiple options you know you are you, you kind of can react off of off of each other but you know, let's let's say there's a defense that is uh, privy to sliding off the crease with keeping guys down the alley. Let's use that that example. Well, what what happens if he goes topside? You know, what happens if he stops in his dodge? You know, what happens if he goes down and redodges and rolls back and, and changes things and changes your angles and now your fills are actually liabilities. And so, um, I believe that, and I, and I and it's funny that you said this. As an offense, the ball's always in your court. You know, it's in your hands. You you can you can do whatever you want, and and you can kind of manipulate the defense to to, to your liking. And uh, that's the nice thing about being on this side of the ball. Welcome back to another edition of uh, Michigan Lacrosse Review. We're talking with Matt Brown, who is the associate head coach uh, and offensive coordinator uh, at Denver. 
uh, University of Denver for the men's lacrosse program. And I guess the easiest thing to start with this is I have a, a thousand questions from our opener, but let's let's start in, in Burnaby, British Columbia, which is where you grew up. Is that fair? Yeah. Were you yeah. a hockey player and a lacrosse player? What was your what did you do growing up? Hockey player first played played hockey, soccer and baseball. And, um, you know, like every other Canadian, you know, you, you put your, your laces on at a, at a young age and dad throws you on the pond and, and you dream of winning a Stanley Cup. And, uh, you know, we played baseball in the springtime and a bunch of my hockey teammates convinced me to put the bat and glove down and come join them um, back in the rink um, after the, the ice is melted. And, uh, you know, and I did that. And I honestly never, never, uh, never went back. You know, I just fell in love with the game, you know, and, and so I was a hockey lacrosse guy. My dad was a soccer player. He was my soccer coach. He never played hockey. He never played lacrosse. So I continued to play soccer, you know, all the way up through high school. But, you know, my root, my true passion was, was hockey and lacrosse. And, uh, you know, I was really blessed and fortunate to have some, some great coaches over the years and some amazing role models. Most of our hockey team was, the, was the same kids that went over and played on the lacrosse team. And when you look at it and, you, and it was kind of all said and done, um, you know, half of us went, half of, half of them went, played hockey, half of them went off to, to pursue, to, to pursue lacrosse. But uh, man, those were some fun years. I would assume we're talking inside lacrosse, we're talking box inside for you. All box lacrosse. I, I really never stepped on a, a field lacrosse field until later in my high school career. And, you know, our field lacrosse version is very different than the field lacrosse version that kids are used to playing today. It was, you would show up with 12 guys, right? you know, and you, you played center midi or you played left midi or you played right midi. And it was like soccer, but lacrosse, you didn't come off the field. You know, I, I don't think I ever came off the field on a Sunday afternoon and you wouldn't practice. You just kind of show up and it was really just community Sunday ball. And it was just, something different when the ice was down and you couldn't get on the surface to, to go out and make sure you keep your stick in your hands. What position did you play in hockey? You know, I, I, I kind of floated around. I, I played center to start and then I jumped to the wing. And at the end of my career, when I, when I uh, was playing midget and junior, I ended up being a, a defenseman and uh, you know, loved kind of carrying the puck out, um, you know, uh, out of the zone and loved being, you know, playing at the, at the blue line on the power play and, uh, you know, but ho hockey was was my first love and, and, and still love it to this day. You were a uh, midfielder in attack, I think, in uh... played attack. No midfield for me. You know, okay. when it came to lacrosse, I was not crossing that line. You know, I was a crease attack man. You know, I probably touched the ball a total of maybe 10 or 12 times throughout the course of the whole game, probably for a duration of, uh, you know, no more than 45 seconds. So that was uh, that, that that was that was kind of my role. But uh I think that helped me, you know, through being a crease guy. I think it's very similar to being a goalie at the defensive end. You know, the goalies are quarterbacks of the defenses. They need to kind of understand and communicate and, and, and direct traffic back there on top of stopping the ball. And I think as a crease attackman, it's very similar. When you don't have the ball on your stick, you're able to kind of see things develop and, uh, and learn what the defense is doing and help communicate, you know, between people. Um Western Canada and Eastern Canada are really unique and, and different in their indoor game where if you played hockey and I'm a Canadian guy, I'm a left hander who came through that, that the one handed process. It's just kind of written that you're going to play indoor box for whatever junior team you play for much more organized. And I don't know that it was quite as organized out, out West. Is that a fair statement? Um, it, I think yes and no. I think, you know, I grew up in Burnaby. I played junior for the Burnaby Lakers. I think when you, when you look at, you know, Western Canada, we just from a population standpoint, you know, the East is so much more you know populated. And so right. uh, I, I think during the years when I played junior, you know, junior A lacrosse for us to be competitive, we, we had to bring in some Eastern guys to, right. to, to help us. And um, we brought in the Prairie boys, you know, we were, we were really one of the first programs to, to tap into the Alberta market. And, uh, you know, a lot of guys, um, you know, have gone up through the, through the ranks. Now you look at, you know, Taylor Ray who's the head coach at St. Joe's, him and I were longtime teammates. Um, you know, he was from, he was from Alberta, him and his brother, Devin, Jeff Schneider, who, you know, was, uh, 
you know, uh, all world MVP, um, you know, two time, you know, world champion, uh, came to the university of Denver, you know, with me, you know, he was from Alberta. And so, you know, Burnaby was clever and, and we were kind of ahead of our, ahead of our time as far as, you know, not just kind of building from within, within the city of Burnaby, but we also went out and got the best from everywhere else. You mentioned Jeff Snyder. I, I had the good fortune in, in London in 2006 to stand sidelines and, and watch him destroy a, a U.S. team that threw everything they could throw at him. Um, they, they could not figure out. And I, I want to say he was 90 percent effective in the second half yeah. against, uh, against the uh, United States, which they ended up ended up beating him. Snyder is as good a faceoff guy as I've ever seen. You know, what's funny about Jeff is he wasn't a faceoff guy, you yeah. know, until he got to college here. And, uh, you know, Jeff is, you know, he was a fighter, you know, and, and he was he was a big time junior A hockey fighter. And we brought him in to Burnaby as kind of a de- defensive transition guy. He played with this, you know, uh, tennis racket of a stick. He had terrible stick skills, you know, and but I tell you what. He scored big time goals for you at the right moment. He was he's he's without question the greatest competitor that I've I've ever been around, and um, he's he's such a huge part to me. He defines what Canada Lacrosse is all about. And uh, you know I'm coaching the under under 19s, which is now the under 20 team, um, and, and it's fun. We, we kind of have a Burnaby Lakers staff. Taylor Ray's on the staff with me. Mark Marashita, who's the head coach at Canisius. Who was who was the captain of our Burnaby Laker teams growing up? He's on the staff, and and so is Jeff. So um, the the four of us uh, are able to continue kind of uh, what we did at our in our younger years uh, together, or continue, continuing to be together and, and coaching the game that we love. You went to uh, Denver. How did you uh, get on the radar of uh, at the time the head coach at uh, Denver was Jamie Monroe? Yeah, that was. Um, you know, totally unexpected. I, I, I had dreams like most Canadian lacrosse players when you're younger of uh, going to Syracuse, you know, and, and, you know, I tell you, it, I, I kind of took it for granted when I was young, you know, on Saturday nights at Peoria Arena, you get to watch the Adnax play the Shamrocks. And on that floor, you know, you'd have you know, Gary Gate, Paul Gate, John Traveris, Colin Doyle, Jimmy Veltman, Tracy Kaluski, John Grant Jr., Dallas Elliott, you know, these, these are the best, some of the best, best guys that have ever played our game. And that was a typical regular Saturday night with you know, sitting in the stands with, with a couple hundred people, you know, with, uh, with, with your popcorn. And so um, I grew up watching Paul and Gary and, and I loved them and uh, tried to mimic uh, what they did, what they, what they did never could never come close to it. Uh, but I loved Syracuse and, and I went down to Syracuse as a, my, my family, uh, my extended family on my mom's side uh, lives in Kingston, Ontario. And uh, so we fly to Ontario. We spend some time with them and we drive down to Syracuse and go visit the campus. And, um, you know, Roy Simmons was there and he, he was in the library and he was signing uh, these posters, this artwork posters that, that he created. And he actually he wrote, signed one for me and wrote my name on it when I was really young. And so I had that on my wall and that was my dream. So one day, fast forward now, a bunch of years, I'm working at a Safeway on a Sunday while I'm a senior in, in high school. And I had the morning shift. I started at, uh, you know, 2 a.m. and uh, got off at 10 and uh, was just stocking the shelves. And I'll never forget when I came home, I said to my dad, I said, I don't want to be doing this for the rest of my life. And he says, well, what are you going to do about it? And, uh, and so I wrote an email. We just got a brand new computer. First time we had the internet at home and, and, and it was a dial up. So it was taking me a while, but I sent an email out to every university that I could find that had lacrosse, that had a lacrosse team in the United States. I knew nothing about NCAA college lacrosse other than Paul and Gary went to Syracuse. I got some interesting, you know, emails back. I, I sent a bunch of emails to some programs that only had women's, you know, there was no men's team there. Um, but within, within 45 minutes, I got a phone call from Jamie Monroe and, and he called me up and um, he said, I'm going to come up and see you in two weeks. Came up and see me, uh, saw me play. And he had a little bit of a, a uh, like a camp up there and, and he would spend some time with my family, flew me down the next week. And the next thing you know, I was, became a Denver pioneer and uh, probably the greatest decision uh, without question, the greatest decision of my life. He was one of the first, maybe the first, that went up north of the border, decided to grab talent because I don't know that a lot of guys were doing that. Is that a, that's pretty accurate, I think, isn't it? 
I think it, it is accurate. You know, at the time, you know, right, right when I came down to school, there wasn't many, you know, there was, there was a few that went off, especially Western Canadians that were before me where they went off to Whittier and played down there. A couple went to Mercyhurst and played down there. Uh, but I think what Jamie thought is I got to be a little different. You know, I don't think you, you didn't see the Maple Leaf invasion like you have it today, you know, down in the college ranks. And so it was it was new. And, you know, I know he went after Sean Greenhall, who was in my class, and he ended up going to Cornell and Craig Kahn, who was a teammate of mine uh, in junior and, and played played against for a number of years in a bunch of mental cups. In my opinion, I think he's the he's the best guy. He's the best player that, that I've ever been around is Craig Kahn. And uh, he ended up going to UMass. Um, but I think that was Jamie's mindset, and uh, and he kind of he built it from there, and I'm thankful he did. Is geography a part of that discussion? Because obviously Denver wasn't the hot spot that it is now, and you know it's a lot closer to Western Canada than anything you know west of Detroit. And it, I, it was it by happenstance or because there was just players? Because Jer- J- uh, Jamie didn't get a lot of guys out of, out of, out of the Canadian East. Not not a ton. You know, we ended up getting a few, and we've had a few since then. Um, for me, it was the closest place to home, without question. To be honest with you, when I was playing hockey, I came down to Colorado Springs, and we didn't travel much to the United States. My family would occasionally go to Palm Springs. That was kind of like going to Hawaii for us. That was a big, big deal, you know? <laughs> so we go to Palm Springs, and uh, you hang out by the pool, and you get to go play golf and see the palm trees, and you're just kind of – your eyes were kind of wide open. And, uh, you know, but when we came down to Colorado Springs for a youth hockey tournament, so I, that was like one of the few places in the United States that I've been, um, you know, outside of Seattle, driving across the border. And uh, we came down and we won this hockey tournament, the, the President's Cup at Pikes Peak. And, uh, you know, that was a big time memory for me. And so I, I had this a little bit of a connection with Colorado um, because we came down here and had that wonderful experience. And then the other thing that, you know, for, for, for me was it was a newer program. You know, Denver just went Division One in 1999. And so they were starting things new and, and, and I wanted to be a part of, you know, something that we could build. And um, it took a while, you know, I think coming down here um, at first, it was a struggle. I, I'd be lying to you if, there, if I said to you, there wasn't days that uh, I'd call home and, and say, uh, you know, I, th- these guys don't want to win. I don't want to be here. Uh, and thank goodness I, I have the dad that I, that I have and said, you know what, you know what, you figure it out. You're not coming home. And, uh, um, you know, but we, we got there. And uh, I can honestly say that our class that we had, that Jamie did a great job of bringing together, really helped shape the program and moved it forward and, uh, you know, kind of kind of propelled us to, to where we are now. How long did it take you as a player to figure out that Jamie wasn't approaching it the way everybody else was? You know, it probably took me a while to figure it out as a player. You know, I was just, uh, I, I, I was really clueless to at the time of, of what was going on here in the States. I was just, my only thoughts were, you know, I want to go to school. I don't want to be stocking shelves on Sundays anymore. And I want to play lacrosse and I want to win. And um, and be a great person. And, and you know, but it, as, as I got older through college, you started to figure out that this was kind of the path we were, we were going to take. And, uh, and, and he did a great job with it. So, um, you know, and, and we've, we've kind of taken it to a whole new level, obviously. And we'll talk about with Coach Tierney kind of coming out here and um, the, the, the kind of re-spark of the West and bringing a ton of energy and kind of his championship mentality and, you uh, but, you know, the Canadian culture is – it's ingrained in the University of Denver men's lacrosse program and forever will be. You have a finance and marketing major from Denver? I do. Yeah, and I do. When yeah. did coaching – So I uh, – When did what, – what did you want to do coming out? And then when did, when did the coaching bug hit you? Yeah, so my, my family – I had one, one cousin who went to – post-secondary education. And, and she was a criminology major. She went to Simon Fraser University, probably the brightest in our whole group. And uh, so when I was coming down here, I, because she was a criminology major, I thought, well, that's what I'm going to do. You know, she was a criminology major. I'll go do the same thing. I came down here and quickly learned that that's not the direction I wanted to go. Uh, so I dibble dabbled in some different areas, but I got intrigued with numbers and the stock market and, um, you know, was interested in, in business in general and, and, and found a good balance between 
um, you know, later on in my junior and senior year of, of finance and marketing and really enjoyed those classes. And, uh, you know, right out of college, I, I worked for a small financial firm here in Denver and, you know, typical entry level position. I was thankful that, uh, that I got the job and, uh, you know, it didn't take me long when I was going to my cubicle and I had this big glass window outside and, and, and uh, I was looking outside the, the beautiful weather every single day. And I just, you know, I don't think I really want to be stuck indoors for the rest of my life. Um, and at that time, the NLL just had their draft. And I mean, I was anticipating that I was going to stay in Colorado uh, and, and actually Arizona jumped them. And they picked me ahead of Colorado, and, and I ended up getting drafted by the Arizona Sting. And, and Bob Hamley, who was the GM and the coach at the time, said, hey, um, you know, what do you think about moving down here? And so I came, I came home after work, um, the finance job, after you know, being there for about five, six months. And I said to my, to my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, I said, what do you think about moving to Arizona? And she said, I'm in. Let's do it. Let's go tomorrow. And uh, so we, we packed up the blazer, and we – moved down to Arizona for the year, but, uh, and, and that's kind of where the, fi- I left the finance piece behind and I started diving into this coaching thing. At a time when you couldn't make a living as a lacrosse player professionally, that's a pretty serious jump of faith. It was. And, and you know, what I did is we decided to get into the camp industry. And so my wife and I said, we'll do this thing. She's a, she was a realtor, so she could kind of work from afar and she could do things, you know, uh, in different places. And I said, you know, I really want to coach the game the way that I believe it should be played. And so we started this camp company and the first year we had four different camps and it worked out well. And we, we did one in Arizona. We did one in Nashville, Tennessee. We did uh, two in Colorado. Um, and so that's where I really got into coaching and then when I was down in Arizona, I was kind of this uh, free agent coach where high schools would call me up and I would come coach their teams for a week and put them through the put them through the ringers and you know teach them some things that maybe they've never heard of, especially from the box game. And and it was all great because it tied into being an Arizona Sting and and you could get them to the games. And I was living down there for the first year when playing in Arizona, so that's kind of really where I felt like you know, I got my feet wet. And then after my first year in playing professionally, Jamie called me up and he said, Hey, we got an opening uh, as a volunteer assistant. Would you, would you, I want you to come take this. Would you want, would you be interested? And, and without hesitation, I, I jumped all over it. You know, I just wanted to, I wanted to give back to the place that gave me so much. And uh, you know, we love being in Denver. Um, my wife's family's from Denver. I knew I wasn't going, uh, wasn't, I wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. And uh that's kind of how I got back to DU. How'd you get this from this? Did you get back to you? You played for the Outlaws for a while, right? Played for the Outlaws, yeah. Did, how'd you get from the Sting back to the Outlaws? So the Sting was in the NLL, and then I got picked up in the supplemental draft. That's right. By the Outlaws, and, and that was in their inaugural year. Well, that was when the MLL, you know, expanded out west, and they added uh, Denver, Chicago, LA, and San Francisco. Really exciting time in in MLL's history. Uh, Brian Reese was the head coach and GM for the outlaws at the time. And obviously the Broncos owned them then they don't, they don't anymore, but, uh, so that was kind of a big buzz. That was, that was another big thing about Denver lacrosse. And one of the reasons why it, uh, it's grown so rapidly, like it has over the last couple decades, but that's how, that's how I got connected with the outlaws. So now you're at Denver, you've got this offensive background and the guy you're coaching with is, you know, arguably one of the better offensive minds in the last 25 years in terms of the sport. Yeah. Do you, is how does that tie together or was it more of a learning process, a collaborative process? And well, how did you take it from there? You know, I think one thing about Jamie, what, what he did is I think he had his ideas of how to play the game, but I think he really liked learning from Canadians. And I think he, he, he still does, you know, if, if you follow him, he's always picking up different things from Canadian guys and, and, and trying to um, put them into place. Some work, some don't, you know, but yeah. um it was just exciting for me to get back and, and be, be a part of the university and have so much pride. Uh, I had so much pride in going to school here and uh, you know, it was, it was fun to be back at, uh, at, at Barton field and, uh, and, and coaching on a, on a daily basis. But uh, you know, one, one of the times, you know, w- one of the areas where I felt that I learned the most was a couple different places was playing professionally 
with my teammates. So in Arizona, guys like Dan Dawson, who was in the NLL for a long time, still in the NLL, you know, right now. Uh, and, you know, he taught me so much about, about the indoor game. And I thought I was pretty well versed in the indoor game, had a pretty successful early career in it, but I learned so much from him. Kurt Malowski, who was my junior A captain, our junior A coach, my last year in playing for Burnaby. He was my teammate now in Arizona. I learned a ton from him and then playing for the outlaws, you know, playing alongside of guys like, um, you know, Josh Sims and Brian Langtree. And we had Ryan Powell for a while and then watching Brendan Mundorf play and Drew Westervelt and, you know, looking at, you know, Lee Zink uh, and, and learning more of the, the defensive end of the game on top of listening to Dave Cottle on the phone, talk to Jamie about, you know, kind of full field stuff and just taking notes, pages and pages, you know, of notes of what Cottle's saying and, and he's going all over the place, but, you know, that's where I really dove into the X's and O's and um, started to kind of, create my own identity you know, with, with that, but from learning from, from these other guys. I've, I've told a story, I think a couple of times, but in California, somebody asked me if I wanted to be involved with the lacrosse, a growing lacrosse program. I had some background. Of course, he asked where the rink is and it kind of looked crazy. Well, we play on a field. Well, anyway, long story short, somebody hands me the one four one championship tape from Dave Cottle. That was the only, you know, got to start someplace. And I, Watched the tape and I watched it and I watched it. And we had a kid that was, uh, lack of a better term, he could not play inside, save his butt. So we moved him up high and we kind of moved some things around and kind of ran a hybrid. We've been running the same offense for the last probably 20 years. And I still have cleaned my office the other day and I still have back. Right. Well, anyway, it's, it's someplace in my, in my facility. It's right here. <laughs> And it's like I'm. St you still go back to the same, you know, go back to the same presence. And and Dave did a great job at uh, at, at 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 all the rest of it. Um, you're we're, you're an unbelievable player, and not everybody that coaches, not everybody that plays well coaches well. There's an exception to that. And and my my caveat on that question is, do you get more respect early on as a better player as a coach, or does you don't think your playing had anything to do with your coaching? Yeah, you know, I, I think I, you know, I, I played the game well. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I think I was uh, the, re the recipient of a lot of others' hard work, you know, with, um, as, as my dad would always say, is that your grandma could have scored that one, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it, it was, he was right, you know, and she probably could have, you know, she was, she was pretty tough. But, you know, so I, I think I, I, I was, I, I was a good player. I wouldn't say I was a great player, um, but, I think my playing helped me learn how to, uh, how to coach. Um, you know, I think being involved as a young guy and learning from others around me and being involved in the game was something that I think is really important. And I'll never forget that, you know, we have our volunteer assistant now is, is Eric Adamson who played on our 2015 national championship team. And, and, and probably in my mind, the most underrated player that was on that team and maybe almost underrated player in the country that was playing that year. He was so valuable and, you know, he just loves to dive into what are they doing today? You know, what are, what's the game looking like? You know, I think a lot of times in coaching, you know, you, you need to have structure. You need to have um, discipline, which which obviously we do. And Coach T has brought with him. And that's why we've been successful. But you also need to continue to be creative. And, and that doesn't mean be frivolous. You know, there's, there's a difference between that. You need to be disciplined and creative at the same time. Um, and so, you know, to answer that question, I, I think – I think it's just all kind of helped me and um, it's just been a lot of fun. You know, I, I'm a big number, you know, numbers guy. I was a finance major. I love math. I, I love puzzles. I love trying to solve it. You know, I, I love trying to sit down and trying to figure this thing out and not coming up with the right answer and going back to the drawing boards. And, and some of the, the you know, the, one of the best parts about being in this profession is interacting and working with guys in your program with, with student athletes that, you know, you, you've kind of helped them see it the way you see it. And now they're helping you come up with new ideas or helping you figure out the solution that there's no better feeling than, than that. And uh, we've had a lot of that go on here at Denver. To bring it to a Michigan connection, you were in the great Western as a player, as a coach in the early days, the great Western was played right here in Birmingham, Michigan. 
So we got a chance to see you play and, and, and kind of process that. That uh, was towards the ends of uh, Jamie's career. I think Jamie's last year was 2009, if not mistaken. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So now you're still on the coaching staff and then all of a sudden they find themselves in a situation where they've got to go East or in this case, I, I say they go East, they went East and found Bill Tierney. And so the first time you hear that name, what's, what goes through your mind and do you, you know, just kind of walk us through from Jamie's departure to Bill's hiring. Yeah, that was uh, a, a really unsettling time for, for all of us, you know, uh, we didn't know what was going to happen. You know, John Torpy was here. who's a great friend of mine. And I love Torps. And, and he was, he was applying to be the next head coach here at Denver. And I was in full support of him and, and would have loved to continue to work alongside of him. And there were some other guys that they were interviewing and, you know, I, I was kind of thinking that Torps was going to get the job. And then all of a sudden uh, the bomb hits and uh, Bill Tierney came to town and, uh, you know, I didn't know Coach Tierney at all. The, the, the only interactions I ever, I've ever had with Coach Tierney, it's a pretty funny one. So Trevor Trevor coached me my freshman year. Trevor moved out after playing at Princeton. Coached yep. with Jamie here at Denver. Coached me my freshman year. Well, my first ever collegiate game in the springtime, it was an exhibition game, was in February of my freshman year, and we played Princeton. And, uh, and I still bug him today because – we played four quarters, you know, you know, original four quarters, and they they were they were up on us. But we played an extra quarter because it was an exhibition, and we ended up beating them. You know, and I think I had five or six goals, right? So I keep I always give it to Coach T. You know, about I said, well, Denver actually beat Princeton, you know, in the right. early years, right? So as you can imagine, he loves that. But we, you know, Coach T, you know, being him and him and Helen, being the people that they are, they hosted our team to their at their house in in Princeton in New Jersey. And uh, we're all downstairs, nice big dinner. And we're all downstairs. Well, well, Trevor's got this player of the year stick, you know, that's on the wall. Well, I didn't really notice that it was like, you know, player of the year stick. Well, I grabbed the thing and I start playing around with it like a fiddle stick. And so oh, Coach D comes down. And so that was my first interaction <laughs> with him. Other than that, didn't really know him that much. Um, got to know Trevor you know, very well um, because we were teammates on the outlaws and became great friends. Um, he was involved in, in the club industry out here early in the early days of club lacrosse here in Colorado. I was involved in the club industry out here in the early days of Colorado. And so, um, you know, coach T comes out here. Um, you know, I don't know what's, what to expect. Um, he calls me and, you know, his, his first day accepting the job. And, you know, we talk for 45 minutes to an hour and, he says, well, I got a lot of things to get in order. And uh, he said, I'll let you know in the next couple of weeks, um, you know, what direction I'm going to go. And uh, 20 minutes later, he called me back and he says, I need you here. And, uh, you know, I want you to be a part of this thing. And uh, so I was just so thankful that, that he uh, wanted me to stay. Did you hesitate at all? No, not, 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 not at all. And the reason being is the school. You know, I, I just – I'm, I'm so thankful for what this place gave me. Um, if it was anybody other than Coach Tierney, maybe that might be a little bit different. Right. Um, but when you brought somebody out here that you never would have thought, I, I, I knew what was going to happen. He was just not knowing him, but, no, but, but you know, being older now and knowing his history, I knew this was going to change. And, and there was obviously a, a piece of me that was really upset about what just happened with the, the, my coach and, uh, and, and my, my peer and John Torpy who just got let go. And, um, but the reality was I, I probably wasn't moving anywhere across country anyways, because my wife's family's here and she wanted to stay here. So it was like, you know, I'm, I'm, it was kind of easy decision. We all looked at it as being the Denver decided to make a serious attempt at being uh, a great lacrosse program. Yeah. And by building, thinking about building it, they announced plans for a new stadium, and they, they did a lot of things. And I think all of a sudden that was the, the, the market of Denver lacrosse was also growing. Amateur lacrosse was growing. Yeah. And I think a lot of that had to do with, with Gary Gates time in at, at Denver playing. I think when you yeah. put 16,000 people in um, the Pepsi center, I'm not sure what they called it in those days, but whatever the facility was. It was, it was the, it was called the Pepsi center. Now it's called ball arena, but uh, it's, it was the Pepsi center. Yeah. 
but I think a lot of folks realized that with, with Bill going there, that it was going to be a, a, it was going to be a different process. We had a chance to interview him for this show. And is it fair to say that people don't really know him? They see, there are two different guys. They, they see what is the disciplinarian kind of old school guy, but I, I just, I think he's so much, I mean, I know he's much more than that, but do you think everybody really knows him as well as they should? A, a lot don't. And, and I think you, if you, if you ask people that know him really well, they'll tell you the same thing. It's um, the thing that's just been amazing to me about coach Tierney is he, he's able to wear so many different hats. You know, he is this gentle, you know, gentleman here in the office um, who you can sit down and, and not talk a, a word about lacrosse and about life and about family. And he's so caring and he's so loving and then when he goes down to that locker room, he puts his whistle around his neck and he puts his baseball cap on. You're going to hear it from him if you don't pick up a ground ball the right way. Right. And, you know, and that's what I love about him. Right. And, and, and uh, I think that's, that's, that's what everybody loves about him. And, uh, but he's just, he's just an amazing human being. And um, we're lucky to have him. One last question about sort of the personal part of lacrosse. We talked a little bit about offense, but you've been in Denver now for your entire career. Yeah. And you must love Denver. You've all obviously alluded to the fact that your family's uh, interest are there. Is, is there been an interest in looking over the fence and seeing maybe what's outside of uh, Denver? Or are you happy where you are? Well, you're, of course you're happy, but yeah. have, have you thought of leaving? Or is it maybe the idea that, that you're the heir apparent? There, there's been some opportunities to, you know, pursue. And, um, you know, some of them, you know, maybe we did take a look at, at but it, there's, this is home for me. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really comfortable here. I love the support that we get. We're very lucky to be at a school that doesn't have football. You know, we're, we're a hockey lacrosse school. I was a hockey lacrosse guy. You know, I, I came here because of the people. I, I'm staying here because of the people. And I just believe in this school. And when you have the support that, that you get here uh, and, um, you know, having no excuses on why you shouldn't be great, uh, it's a place you want to be at. And, um, you know, my, my goal is to, to make this program the best lacrosse program in the history of our game. And that's, uh, that's, that's why I want to stay here. I was, and I was the president of the intercollegiate club women's league. I was Michigan state's women's coach. Your uh, club team has been national champions a number of times the last few years. And that's all that they're, they talk about when we go to meetings is the support the university gives them. Yeah. And, well, that's not something that's just for, for your sport. It's, it's, I think it's throughout the athletic department from at least yeah. the, from what I've seen. We have some uh, background with the ski department, with the ski team, the Alpine ski racing team, and they're they're a first class uh, organization. To, to without doubt, they're just they they do things well. One, I'm curious to ask this question: You're an assistant coach, and then you get named associate head coach. Is it a title bump for ego? And I don't mean yours, but in just in general, is it, is there different responsibilities? Is there more money? Because I don't know very many associate head coaches, and I'm, I'm always wondered why, what's the difference between an associate and, 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 and an assistant, or is there a difference? Well, I think at the time, I think you, you know you alluded to it. There was maybe some other job openings out there that were that were interested, um, and you know I think that um, you know coach when Coach T first came here, he he had no experience with dealing with scholarship dollars being in the Ivy League, and uh, you know so I you know, we kind of work together and he's just done a great job of letting me learn from him and, and being in the room on, 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 in all of these meetings with him. And, and so I think it got to a point where coach T being the guy that he is, he, he kind of wanted to, you know, reward me in a way that he could and, and, and announce that. And, um, and I've been thankful for it, but he's, he's just, he, he includes, includes us, includes us all in, in, in everything. You know, my, my goal is if, if, if I could write the script myself, I'd love to stay here and be the next head coach here without question. Uh, and I'd love to have coach T continue to be a part of our program till, till, till for forever. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of our, our dream with this whole thing, obviously dealing in the world of college athletics, you never know. Right. Uh, but uh, that, that's, that's my dream. I mentioned him during our interview. I think you're very much to, to, to coach as, Jerry Byrne was to Kevin at Notre Dame. I think that sort of level of, but now you've got um, your defensive coordinator is John Gallant. Am I correct? Yep. 
Yeah. So Brian Holman was on the show. And one of the things that we talked about is his staff. It seems like all of a sudden there's a little bit like LeBron James basketball where we're lining up these coaching staffs with all these all-stars and guys that are really good at it. I don't know of a coaching staff that's a whole lot better than either Denver or Utah. There's very few that have the cachet of, of talent. Not only can they play, but they can coach pretty well as well. Is that mm-hmm. by design or just because they're available? Well, I think what Utah has done is, is pretty remarkable. They got young guys that are in the game, you know, and I think as I alluded to before, I think that's an important piece of the, of the whole thing. You know, our, our thing with, with John Galan is, is that, you know, John Orson was here. We brought him in in 15, um, you know, Dylan Sheridan moved on. He went off to uh, Princeton uh, to coach there and then ended up being the head coach at Cleveland state. And now is at Western reserve Academy. And so, you know, he had that path, but when we brought Orson in, it was, you know, Coach T was an attackman, and, and he coached defense, right? And so because schematically, he has the big picture, and, and he knew it. And, and John Orson was one of the best defensive players to ever play our game, you know. And so he was – people don't realize this. John Orson was, a, was, a, was an all-star in the, in the NLL. He was an American guy who was, was, an, was an all-star in, in, in the box game. And then he was also an all-star in, in, in the field game. And so he had that kind of individualized defensive development component. And we were lo- really looking for that. And so we brought John in and, you know, we had some great years and uh, obviously would have loved to have John stay. And, uh, but for his family, it was the right move to move back to Navy. And so then we were sits, you know, faced with this void here at the DN and what, what do we do? Well, John Gallant's been around us forever. You know, he, he's, he's a school teacher. You know, he was coaching, teaching elementary school kids, third grade, and then moved up to uh, high school kids. And he coached a little bit of high school field lacrosse, but he's from Brantford, Ontario, you know, played for the Six Nations Arrows, you know, growing up. Um, He actually played against Burnaby in the uh, 2098 Minto Cup out West. Uh, went on and played 15 years in the NLL, was the captain of the Colorado Mammoth, played for Team Canada, won a world championships in indoor. Um, but he moved out to Colorado because he played for the Mammoth and, you know, met his wife and he's living here. They have kids and, uh, you know, it's kind of all settled, you know, into, into his life. But I brought him in to coach box lacrosse. We started a box program here it, it, through Denver Elite about 11 years ago. And it's, it's been great. We've grown up, we've grown to 12 different boys box teams and, and um, Jamie Shuchuk, who's another Burnaby Laker who lives down in Colorado and, and, and myself and needed some extra help. So we reached out to John and John jumped on board. And so I've gotten to know John really, really well. This guy's a teacher and he hasn't been in the co- collegiate coaching ranks. Didn't coach much field across, you know, right. a couple of years of high school, uh, but he played at the highest level. He covered Gary Gate. You know, he covered right. John Traveris. Right. I don't know if he covered him well or not, but he, but he tried to cover <laughs> him. Right. So, you know, this guy is a, this guy's a teacher and, and just getting to know him and what he believes in. Um, you just thought it was a no brainer. And so when, when John Orson decided to leave, it, it took me, took us all of uh, five minutes to say, Hey, John Gallant's going to be our next coach here if, if he wants it. And uh, so thankful that he's accepted it. And I'm excited to, have them uh, be a part of this thing for a long, long time. As it relates to your offensive prowess as a coach, uh, 2014, we started hearing an awful lot about, you know, sort of that Canadian influence in the two-man game, and it started to maybe make the front page of Inside Lacrosse magazine, and it became a much more um, obvious discussion with other lacrosse guys, especially Americans. I always had one hand, and our kids, we always practiced one hand. It was never an issue for, for us, but 2015, you go on and win the title. NCAA Division I title, and you played rather uniquely at the time. So my question is, is Box, where's Box going? Where are we? And has everybody sort of caught up to what you guys were doing in 15? Yeah, that's a great question. And that, that goes, this goes back to what I said in the opening, uh, opening question that you had was everything's kind of cyclical. You know, the way we're playing the game now is different than the way we're playing in 15. Yeah. It's just because – people catch up, you know, like the, the, the amount of film that's out there, the amount of coaching that is going on now today, it's, it's never, ever been like this. And it will continue to be even more, you know, as our sport continues to grow and, and elevates itself. And so, you know, we, 
we're, we're playing this blend. You know, I believe in, in being multiple, you know, the, the things that are, that are staples to us is, is ball movement, people movement and decision-making. And those are three things that I feel like I can teach is ball movement, people movement and decision-making, you know, the things that, um, you know, where we're different is we might have a group of guys that are a little bit more downhill, a little bit more Americanized, you know, put your foot in the ground, shoot it to both hands. That's hard to defend. You got to play a certain way to defend that. And then we might have a group that if you just made them and forced them to play that way, they would be terrible lacrosse players. But if you bring them to the half boards and you let them play a little bit of a slower dodge and you let them kind of, you know, slow the game down, they're really hard to play against. And so I think it's this being multiple is, is where we've really gone to. Um, and, and again, it comes back, comes back to recruiting, but, uh, you know, I think we did some interesting things early on, you know, and, and it wasn't just 15, it was kind of leading up to 15. It started with Mark Matthews in, in 11, um, with the stuff that we were doing. Right. Um, and it just finally paid dividends in, in, in 15. And, and sometimes it takes a little bit of time, uh, you know, for, for the results to, to come the way you want them. But uh, the game's definitely changing. I think it's changing year by year. And, and I think it, it, it's all cyclical, you know. You're a high school kid, and I'm going to go away, play four games this weekend for some travel team. And I'm going to, I'm going to maybe get 12 touches and those kinds of things. My question to you is, is going in the backyard and shooting 300 balls as effective as maybe even playing a box game or playing the wall? I'm a high school kid. What, I want to develop my offensive skills. What, what am I? What would you suggest to that kid? Well, you you know you you're you're asking that question to me, and I think you know the answer is. Uh, I do. I'm I'm a, I'm a huge believer in the box game, you know, and I just I just think the setting, the the setting, it it just forces you to figure some things out that would take you hours to figure out as a coach to to figure out how to teach it. You know, whether it's this the bounce off the boards, it's the box out plays, it's it's like picking, it's like playing picking up pick up hoops in the city, you know, or in the park with some random guys. You know, you know, you you learn some things about what you can do and what you can't do just in that natural setting. And so I'm a huge believer in that. I, I think it's just, you know, we started this whole box movement here in the United States in twenty in twenty ten with trying to trying to put some uh, you know, some, some rules behind it and some organization behind it with this United States box cross association. It's just kind of gone, gone crazy. But you know, what, what we're seeing a lot of now is we're seeing even a lot more American guys with a box background. You look at a guy like Jack Hanna, you know, he played on our U S box LA national team and did a tour up in BC a couple of years. And, you know, was playing in the college leagues in Ohio during the summertime. And uh, you know, this is a kid that's going to be playing in the NLL one day. And so um, it is, kind of an under-recruited kid from Ohio uh, that no one really wanted to take a crack at. And um, my opinion, he's, he's one of, if not the best midfielder in the country right now. Um, and it's just because he just played a ton of box. Is the top 10, 15 school, the NCAA schools, are they pretty much all on the same level in terms of talent? And it's, is it scheme or is it athleticism? Maybe somebody's got a few better players. Or, yeah. It seems like we're all playing the same game now. It doesn't seem like there's that much, it was a run and gun before, or it was a pattern, or it was, it seems like we're playing sort of this multifaceted game that has a whole bunch of fronts to it. And, you know, it's, it's always been my best athlete against yours, but yeah. now it seems to include more, more guys on the field. Yeah, no doubt. I think the, the gap is it's, there's bigger, there's more people in the mix now without question. You know, there's, there's 20, you know, there's 20 schools. You look around, there's teams that aren't ranked in the top 20 that you that you see on a schedule say, Ooh, I don't know if I want to play them. You know, they're, they're pretty talented. I think it's the growth at the youth level and at the high school level and continu continues to grow. You know, I know some people say it hasn't, but it, it has, you know, and, and, but at the college level, we've grown some at the division one ranks, but we haven't grown at the same rate that the youth in the high school is growing. And so you're just getting better players right. and, and you just don't have as many spots out there. And so everybody's getting better, better players, you know, athleticism, no doubt. You get a guy like Michael Sowers, that guy's a generational player 
you know, Grant Mint, you know, those guys, if you have those guys, you're, you're really fortunate to have them. you got a chance at this thing. But really, I think, is the difference is, is the end of the year, you'll see culture, you know, culture comes into the play, you know, and buy-in, um, peaking, uh, timing, peaking at the right time. You know, we know all know in sports, you know, if, if you peak too early, you just maybe just run out of time. And so I think, and, and, and honestly, there's some luck that comes into this thing too. You know, I think when, when we won in 2015, um, you know, we had the quarterfinals at home at Mile High Stadium, you know, and uh, if we weren't playing at Mile High Stadium, I don't know if we come back from that 8-1 deficit that we had to Ohio State in the first half, you know, with the energy and the momentum. So there's a little bit of luck that comes into play as well. You know, you, you make it to the finals in 2015 and, you know, it, it, your goal obviously is to get there every year. Now it's 2020, coming up on 2021. Have you maybe learned to appreciate a little more that the, the climb to that, to the top of that rung is a lot harder than you thought was before you made it to the 15th championship? Yeah, it's, it's tough. It's, it's real tough. I think what happened when we went to our first one in 11, you know, we were so excited. And I think at the time we were probably just happy to be there. You know, we, sure. we hosted a lot of firsts, right? We hosted our first ever NCAA tournament game at home at Peter Barton against Villanova beat them and went to play Hopkins in the quarterfinals at Hofstra and, you know, beat them as the underdog and big, you know, probably the biggest upset in our, in our uh, program's history. And then, uh, you know, I think we were really just excited to go to, to Baltimore and, and play. And, and we got, we got a wake up call early in that semifinal game against Virginia who had a heck of a squad that ended up winning the championship. Um, but then it was like, you got your, you got the taste of it. And it was like, we, we want, we want to get over the hump. And so, you know, in 2012, we, we, we just ran into a hot Loyola team. You know, we played them three times. They beat us all three times, you know, and that's, and I think two of them were by one goal and one was by two goals. And we had some great games against them uh, in, in the conference championships and also the quarterfinals. And I thought they had one of the best teams in a long, long time that we've seen that won the championships in 2012. And so we ran into them. And then in 2013, again, we battle we come from behind to win a, a big time quarterfinal game and get to the semifinals and we lose 2014, we get to the semifinals, you know, and we lose. And, but it was just like in our heads, it was like, we're going to do this thing. It's going, it's going to happen. And uh, I'd be lying to you if I didn't think that when we were in 2015 and we were up late against Notre Dame and they made that run and they tied it, that I wasn't looking up to the sky and just saying, why, you know, because it's been uh you know, it's been, you know, three, three years in a row, really, where this has happened, you know, and it felt like on the, in the previous two, we, had, we, we could have won that semifinal game. And, uh, but I think everything happens for a reason. And, uh, you know, we, Carson Cannon, uh, you know, a Minnesota boy who makes a nice play on, on Kavanaugh, strips him in overtime, gets us the ball back and Westberg buries one to, to send us to Monday. And, and, you know, we, we win our first championships, you know, so that was kind of the path you were kind of getting there. The hardest thing is to get back there. The hardest thing is, is to stay there. That's a tough, tough task. And, and we learned that uh, the hard way in 16, losing to Towson in the first round. Um, and we were able to get back in 17. And then, uh, you know, I think, we, we, we faced Albany, a tough team in the quarterfinals that I thought we just, we just didn't play our best that day. You know, I think that was one of the more disappointing games in, in, in our postseason runs that we just didn't play our best. And, uh, you know, and then in, in 2019, you know, we, we didn't make the NCAA tournament. You know, we had, we had some hiccups along the way and, you know, losing to, to Georgetown at home in a conference championship game um, that we felt like we, we were prepared for, but I guess we weren't. Um, and then obviously last year. So you do, when you look back at it, do you appreciate it and realize how hard it is? hundred percent. This thing is tough, you know, and especially now in this day and age when there's 20 teams that really are in the mix for this thing, you, you, you know, you've you got to peak at the right time. You got to have a little bit of luck on your side. Parity has value, but it also has downside. And the downside is if you make it there, you, you think you're going to get back quickly and it doesn't always, doesn't always work that way. It doesn't always work. Yeah. One of the questions that I, to kind of wrap up, a couple of things I want to ask you, and this is a question I've been asking all the coaches, and it's been really interesting getting their answers. I see the board behind you. It, you know, I'm sure it has all kinds of stuff about offense and defense, but right now we're in the, in the recruiting world. Physicality or IQ? You want both, but if you had your choice between those two, what do you take? Oof. That's a, that's a, uh, 
That's a good question. I would say by position, um, X attackman, I want IQ. You know, I, I want a uh, midfielder. You know, I want, I want, I want a physical, I want, and you need to have a physical midfielder on your team. You know, I think defensively, you want guys that are, you know, are, are physical. Um, but I would say your ex attackman needs to be the smartest guy on the field, in my opinion. Uh, he, you know, he, he kind of is for us, you know, and uh, we're excited about having uh, Jackson Morrill and Ethan Walker get a chance to play together this, this spring. And, uh, you know, that will be fun to, it's been fun to be out there and practice with them. But, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in, and we've done it this way. We haven't been, always been the most physical team, but we've had at the end of the day, we've had some really smart lacrosse players. Perfect example is Eric Law. You know, you, you, you look at him. He's a little more buff now than what he was in college. You know, I saw him at the golf course a couple of weeks ago at our alumni event. He's looking good, but he was he was he was pretty skinny and small in, in, in college. But he's the smartest player on the field and he knew what you were going to do, you know, five passes ahead. And uh, so I think it's by position. How about goalies? As far as physicality or, or IQ? IQ. That's a good one. That's a, that's a, that's an interesting one. Um, Scott Rogers would be one of those guys that's got both, but not necessarily yeah. everybody has that same opportunity. I'd say I, I'd still go with IQ. Okay. I'd still go with IQ. You know, um, I think long sticks, you want fit, you want, you know, physicality. Uh, I think close D guy, you want D midi physicality. Go, goalie's a, a quarterback of the DN. You, you want him to be pretty sharp. Well, it's the old story of big and fast beats everybody. So it's one of those things that's, yeah. you know, there's a variety of those discussions. We've had a number of coaches who've been fortunate enough to wear the American flag on their uniform. You've been fortunate enough to run that Canadian Maple Leaf on yours. Just maybe talk briefly about what it's like to, to put your country's flag on as a hat or a, or a jacket and, and be a part of that national program. Does it change? Does it, does it, is there goosebumps when you walk out the locker room? Oh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, there's, there's, there's nothing else like it in the world. And I think growing up in Canada, you, you, you always saw, you watch the world juniors every Christmas and you watch the kid, the guys put on the, on the skates and wear the maple leaf. And you, you got goosebumps watch, watching that because they're representing our great country. And, uh, you know, I, I tried out for team Canada um, two times um, in 2016 and in uh no, it would have been 2006. 2006 and 2010. I think 2006, I was probably the first cut, you know, and in 2010, I was the last cut. And uh, that was a tough one to swallow. Um, but I'll never forget the day that Dave Huntley called me up after cutting me. Uh, and, uh, and this is, I just love this man. And uh, he said, I, he says, you got a future with this thing. You got a future with Canada lacrosse and I want you to be a part of this thing moving forward. And uh, he said, would you do it? And I said, yeah, I'm still pissed off at you for cutting me. So, uh, but, uh, you know, I, he, he brought me into the fold and I've been a part of Team Canada ever since. And uh, it's just, it's, there's nothing else like it. Is he the glue for Canadian lacrosse? Is he the guy that, he's the one guy that everybody kind of looks to? He, he is. And unfortunately, he's no longer with us you know, no. anymore. He passed away, but, but he's the one that brought us all together. And we've been able to stay together in his honor. And, um, you know, I think if you look at it now, Randy Mearns has, is kind of the new glue. Um, and he's just done an, an amazing, amazing job with that. And, uh, but we're, we're, I'm fortunate enough that Taylor Ray, Jeff Snyder, Mark Marishita and, and Merrick Thompson and, and, and others, you know, we, Canada Cross is in a great place and um, it's, it's, it's unbelievable to be a part of it. I still wear my Canadian national team hat for their practices from time to time. And everybody kind of goes, where did you get the hat? I said, well, I, I got it. That's all that really matters. I, I showed Brody. Uh, I've got a Canadian a signed stick, a mini stick from 2006 that my son had gotten. We actually have Jeff Snyder's gloves, palms cut out of them from 2006 that are on display here. We still, we still carry the rest of it. So I, I showed uh, Brody the, the stick that, that had all the signatures on it. We had lacquered over it so that the signature wouldn't go away. We uh, take great pride in, in Canadian lacrosse, so that was that was the reason for the question. Is that you know, yeah. you play the national anthem? It's a it's a different it's a different feel. 
what's next for Denver? And maybe the last question for you is um, kind of where, where are you headed and where's the, where's the program and maybe where's college lacrosse headed? Yeah, I know. I think for us, it's, you know, in the immediate future, it's just trying to figure out with how we, what kind of season we're going to have. Are we going to have a season this, this spring? And uh, you know, what does that look like? I think we're, we're, we're getting closer to having a little bit more clarity, but, but still from an NCAA standpoint, we got to see how basketball goes and the, some of those winter, winter sports hockey, our hockey teams going into a bubble um, this, this winter and in, in the end of November, early December, we'll see how that turns out. And uh, so I think that's kind of the, you know, the day by day, um, you know, I think from our program standpoint it is, is getting back there, you know, and I think it's uh, getting back to when I say there it's, it's championship weekend. And, um, you know, we have a group of you know, our, our, we call them super seniors, Ethan Walker and that crew. They're the only group of guys in our program right now that have played in the final four. Um, the other guys have never tasted it. They've never had that experience. And so it's new to them and they're eager to, to, to get there. And, and I can say this, that we've, we've never had a, as good of a group um, depth wise and, and uh, people wise and, and skill wise um, than we've ever had in them right now. And so I'm excited about the future here. And then, you know, I think for us is continuing to grow it. You know, I think every year you, you get to a point, you, you got to look at each, each aspect of your program and you got to say, where can we be better? You know, one of the things we've, we've just launched within our program, not lacrosse related is more of this pioneers lacrosse professionals network, as far as starting to help establish, you know, a longer term vision for our program here at DU, you know, um, you know, you have these already established at Princeton where coach T, you know, was, and, and maybe at some other places like, uh, like a Sarah Hopkins or, um, you know, um, a Cornell um, that has put a lot of emphasis into this. That's kind of next on the horizon for us. And we're, we're in the midst of making that and, and creating that. And it's just been fantastic to see the feedback um, from that and the amount of support we're getting from parents, alums, and friends of our program. And so we're, we're excited about that. I think expansion of our lacrosse stadium, you know, I think that's next on the horizon for us. Before the pandemic, that was it. Uh, and obviously this put a little bit of a pause on it, but Peter Barton has been around since 2006. And then at the time it was the first ever lacrosse only stadium in the nation. And obviously there's been some more since then. Um, and so it's time now. And, and our school, one of the great things and we mentioned it before is the support uh, that, that we have here. They're on board with it. And, and we've proven that we need it, you know, especially with that picture that you can see behind you there, you know, we pack that stands and it's, it's just an amazing atmosphere. So, I'm really excited about the future here. Um, NCAA lacrosse, I think, you know, with the with the shot clock and 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 the dive and, and the uh, new Olympic rules, it's going to be interesting to see which you know which direction the game goes. You know, uh, you know the faceoffs. You know, they changed the faceoffs this year for you know for the for the first time in a long time. They've been talking about it forever. We're going to see how that plays a factor. Um, there's no doubt that it's going faster. It's no doubt that they want to try to take uh, less discretion out of the referee's hands um, the best that they po possibly can and just let them officiate the game. Um, so it's going to be interesting. You know, I think, you know, from a professional standpoint, you know, I think what we saw this past summer with what the PLL did was remarkable, you know, and, and that's exciting. You right. know, I think you look at the NLL and their growth, you know, they just announced another new one down in Texas and, and there'll be more to come here in the near future. And, and, you know, so as a sport, we're in a great spot and it's exciting to be a part of it. And, um, you know, I think we're just, uh, I'm, I'm excited to see the growth of it and see where it's going to go because it's been a long time coming. I would be remiss. There's a behind you. There's a, what looks like a Brown Jersey with the number 16 on it. I just, oh, yeah. I'm just, is that in relationship to Jamie? Oh no, that was no that that that's that's my last name. So that here's a funny oh, it's story. Oh, turned around, right? Okay. Here, here's a funny story with that, just quickly. So <laughs> I played I, I played in the MLL All Star game one year, right? Right. And uh, they auction off your jerseys after you play in it. So my wife, this is hysterical. My wife thought she was going to be really nice and she was going to bid on my jersey and give it to me as a present. And so she was bidding and she was bidding and she was bidding. And all of a sudden she comes to me and she says, Matt, she's like, I wanted to get the jersey for you and make it a surprise because you played in your first all-star game. But your, your jersey's the highest 
one out there. And I said, you got to be kidding me. There's like, you know, there's Brody Merrill out there. There's, you know, there's Casey Powell out there. There's all these guys, My, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm the bottom of the totem pole. How's my jersey so much? He's like, yeah, this this person, Bobro, is keeps bet, uh, bet, uh, bidding against me. I said, Bobro? And uh, my wife, my mom's name is Bonnie Brown. Huh. So I had my I had my mom and my wife buy, bidding against each other for, for this jersey. That's how I got that thing. It was an expensive purchase. So I thought I'd put it up in the office. Well, for completely think stupid thinking it's Brown University instead of your last name, which I probably should have made the connection to. Um, I can tell you from a personal standpoint, from both a club as a club college coach and a high school coach, we I study your films a lot. You've been very uh, innovative and, and instrumental in a lot of the stuff that's going on offensively across the country. Um, I'm not sure you know that, but I, I can tell you that when we talk about offense, you're one of the guys we we talk about. So for that, thank you. And for this uh, interview, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. It's been really fun. And I've never had a bad con conversation with a Canadian. I'm not sure why that is, but we wish you the best of luck in the future. And um, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Well, thanks for having me, Greg, and thanks for everything you're doing for our, for our great sport. And uh, looking forward to chatting with you more in the future.